Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE. Covering Accelerate 2017. Brought to you by Fortinet. Now, here are your hosts, Lisa Martin and Peter Burris. Hi, welcome back to theCUBE. I'm Lisa Martin, joined by my co-host Peter Burris, and we are with Fortinet in beautiful Las Vegas at their Fortinet Accelerate 2017 event. A great event that brings together over 700 partners from 93 countries, and right now, we're very excited to be joined by one of their technology partners, Carbon Black. Jim Rain, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much, I appreciate it, great Absolutely. to be here. Absolutely, you are a key alliance partner, Carbon Black, as you're the director of technology alliances. I know that you've been at Carbon Black for three years, but you're quite the veteran in terms of um, technology, engineering, sales, channel, services expertise. Quite the, quite the veteran, it's quite the sage. Um, but some interesting that. things that I wanted to, to let our viewers know about Carbon Black, and we'll have you expand upon this, is that you guys are the leading cloud-based endpoint security company that stops cyber threats, um, and that your roots are actually in offensive security. You now protect more than seven million endpoints worldwide, and 30 of the Fortune 100 are your customers. Tell our viewers a little bit more about Carbon Black. What are you doing? What are some of the things that you're seeing as security now is a boardroom level topic? We're seeing a lot of changes. It's um, you know, the, the idea of taking a endpoint context, what's actually happening at the endpoints. The endpoints are always the, the real source of where the attacker was, was really targeting to get to the information. Um, and for such a long period of time, we've used legacy technology to really do that. So we're looking at what are some things that we need to do now to really change that entire game. And one of the key things about that is looking beyond just simple files. Um, you know, malware's bad, we know that. And we've had great ways of stopping that for years. And our attackers are moving well beyond just malware today. And they're moving really into leveraging different attacks by actual actors within the customer's environments. And so we're really positioning ourselves to uh, stop those, those next threats, the new threats that we're seeing, and do it in such a way that it's very easy for a customer to do, still manage, still maintain it, and then integrate that with other things. And I think the key word is integrate it with other things. Absolutely. Because it's not just enough to know what the endpoint's doing, you have to know what the endpoint's doing in the context of what it's supposed to be able to do with those other things. Talk a little bit about how that and Fortinet come together for customers. So it was really important for, we, we've had a very strong uh, opinion that open APIs are very important. Um, the idea that we are better together than we are apart, and that really is true in security. Uh, for too long we've had, you know, different vendors that have tried to consolidate everything under one roof, and the problem is that most customers will make financial investments within a given product, and then they need to capitalize on that on every single new product they bring in board. With us from an endpoint context, we really wanted to make sure that our endpoint data, the actual vision of what we're seeing, could be shared with network entities, could be shared with the SOC, and so the SOC can have a holistic picture of the entire environment, not just on-premise, but also off. How, you know, talking about endpoints, tablets, mobile, the proliferation of IoT devices, mm -hmm. how does a company nowadays that, um, we were talking off here, that the day of everybody getting issued a phone or a Blackberry is, is over, but when we're all providing your own devices as employees, how realistic is it for a company to actually secure the things that I, as an empl employee, are doing with my own devices it's, on it's a really corporate tough. network? It, it's really tough. Um, you know, we, we have to control the things we can control, right? Which are the endpoints that we issue. So the laptops, the desktops, the, the home systems. For a lot of engineers now with the remote context, they're working from home on an iMac. Um, we need to be able to protect that as it was on a corporate network. And so part of that is taking that off-network devices, but enabling the corporate assets, the actual on-network devices, to leverage that. And that's what we've done with, with Fortinet. We leverage the Fortis Sandbox so that whenever we see a brand new binary on an endpoint, we can submit that to Fortis Sandbox and say, is it good or is it bad? Obviously, we don't know that binary at that point. We're making a determination. And if Fortis Sandbox comes back and says that is malicious, we can not only stop it from executing again, but also terminate it in motion. One of the things I'm curious about, during the general session this morning, there was a, a CISO panel of Levi's, uh, AT&T, and Lazard was there. There were also some great customer videos, the Pittsburgh Steelers, um, and some uh, other telecommunications companies. When we're talking about what you're doing with Fortinet, expand upon that a little bit more in terms of the integration. Also, are you focused on certain industries that might be at higher risk, healthcare, financial services, for example? Um. Yeah, I mean, I like to say yes, but honestly, I think everybody's at a high risk. Um, I mean, the, the hard part today is that attackers are going after wherever, um, wherever they can find the most valuable data to them. 
And it's not based upon my, my role or my job or my industry, it's based upon what that attacker actually needs. And so we see it in small mom and pop shops, we see it in healthcare, we see it in finance, um, definitely see it in retail a lot recently in manufacturing. And so we really view it as um, the customer needs to take a proper assessment, understand where their assets are, and then deploy multiple different layers, which includes an endpoint uh, solution, um, to actually stop that. So you take our next generation endpoint, you take Fortinet's advanced capabilities on the network, you take the visibility of what they've done with the fabric, and now all of a sudden you have this really great solution that does protect the assets they can control. Um, for IoT, I mean honestly, that's be something we're going to have to be challenged for with a while. But at least if I can segment that a little bit and protect what I can control, I don't throw my hands up and say I can't do anything. Now I have IoT segmented in such a way where I can properly address that with an overall posture. And can we, can we presume that, you, that, that your, your customers have this awareness, this knowledge that we're already breached, we now have to be providing or, or limiting damage? Is that, is that the feeling and the vibe that you're getting when you're talking to customers about endpoint security? I, we hope so. I mean, we came out about three years ago and said that there's an assumption to breach which means don't assume you won't be, assume it's already happened, and assume you just don't know about it. And, and that's really a reality, I think, for a lot of people nowadays. Um, you know, Ponemon does a really great uh, um, yearly uh, expose where it talks about how long a breach has occurred within environments, and it's 200 plus days or some you know, number. The point is, it's, it's always a significant amount of time. So the ability to have more visibility within a network, not only on the network side, but also on the endpoint side, and combine that into one view is so important, because most customers honestly don't know they have been. And then when it is, it's a panic situation, and that's rough. But increasingly, an enterprise that's providing service to a customer or a partner is uh, really providing service to an endpoint somewhere. It and is. So we know, for example, that it's that when folks, when the bad guys are trying to do something malicious, they're just not getting into your network and working their way through your systems until they can find the most valuable data. They also know that if you are a trading partner, that even if your data is not that valuable, the trading partner's data may be very mm -hmm. valuable. And so they are hopping corporate boundaries as well. And so trading partners absolutely have to be able to secure and validate that their relations are, in, are, are working the way that they're supposed to be working. So how does my ability to be a trading partner go up and down based on my ability to demonstrate that I've got great endpoint security in my business? It, you know, that, it's a great question because I don't, I don't know of too many customers that have a, a strict validation to say if I'm a partner of yours, not, not a technology partner, but a business partner, that I expect you to maintain a certain level of security protection. There's just an automatic assumption that we partner with you know, Siebel or somebody else and of course they have a protection in, in, enabled. Um, I think the, you have to raise it up a level. So we have to have the policy mindset to not say that, um, you know, obviously we have different solutions deployed, but what have I enabled? From, from a very broad perspective, what kind of things do I allow my endpoints or do I allow my network to do? What kind of things do I disallow, do I block? Do I you know, have control of domain admin? I mean, something as simple as that. But that forms a policy and then different companies can match policies together and say, yes, you actually do comply with our policy or our security posture, therefore we're going to enable the partnership. Um, because you're right, I mean, if I come in through a partner, even does that allow my, my insurance to cover me from a, a cyber pr protection perspective, um, that may be disallowed because it may be seen as an authorized entry within an environment, not a breach, and so there's all kinds of complexities that come out of that, but we have to have a better way of communicating between our um, companies. So as the, uh, Kenzie, the CEO of Fortinet, talked about mm -hmm. this morning in his keynote, he was talking about the evolution of security going from the perimeter to um, web and web 2.0 cloud, and now we're moving towards 2020 in this time of needing to have resilience and, and automation. And it's also an interesting time as we get towards 2020, and that's not that far away. You know, this is 2017, <laughs> if you can believe that. The proliferation of, of mobile and IoT and tablet, I mean, there's expected to be, what, 20 billion IoT devices connected in 2020, mm -hmm. and not only about a billion PCs. As you see that proliferation, um, and you look at the future uh, in, from an endpoint perspective, how has the game changed today, and how do you expect the game for endpoint security to change in the next few years as we get to 2020? 
I mean, it's, um, it's interesting because I remember the days when I was you know, first installing the firewall, the only one in my enterprise, <laughs> and, and working through that, that kind of you know, perimeter and barrier concept, and, and now that barrier's disappeared. So we see a lot of things move in the cloud, and I think that really is the, the key enabler. What, what Fortinet is doing with, with the CASB structure, and what we're, you know, they're really targeting for a cloud control or cloud protection, we're seeing from a lot of vendors. There's a lot of focus on that right now. Um, because if I have a mobile device, I may not be able to attach the mobile itself because of the, of the operating system or restrictions from the, the provider like uh, iOS has in it, but I can control the application, I can tie into that. And if I tie that back to my corporate environment, so the same policies are being applied, and I can apply that down to my endpoint to make sure that, at least from an application perspective, what's running on my laptop is the same control segment running on my application in the cloud, I now have a better control of the entire environment. And I think that's where our first step is, there's going to be a lot of um, advances, I believe, really in the next 10 years, five years or you know, less for 2020, um, that really bring about some, some unique things concerning to mobile and IoT. Can you share with us a little bit more um, exactly how your technologies integrate with Fortinet's technologies, especially kind of looking at the announcements today, what they're doing with, with FortiGate, the announcements with the operating system? Absolutely, so um, today we, we basically, uh, from an endpoint perspective, anytime we see a binary that comes on to, from our, our CB protection product, we'll uh, send that to Forta Sandbox. At first we'll query it, to find out whether or not they've seen it before. If they haven't, we'll, we'll send it to them and they can do a detonation. Obviously we're taking the results of that back and then we're making a block determination on that. Um, obviously those are things that we haven't already seen before. So with different protection modes and different protection policies are in place. But if I haven't seen that particular binary, it's something brand new, it could be malicious, it could be a zero day. Um, I can play that against the Forta Sandbox to find out whether or not it actually does have that, uh, that malicious nature to it, and then act upon it. I've always thought of endpoint security, and tell me if I'm right, as the first line of defense. It is, I mean, magically we've always thought of the firewall as the first line because we think outward in, but really it is inward out because um, I, you use your laptops at home, right? So yeah. it is the first place that everything always starts. Yeah, so it's the first line of defense, and uh, to my perspective. Mm -hmm. And increasingly as businesses deliver, provide, or their services are in fact based on data, that that notion of the first line of defense accretes new responsibilities for both customers as well as vendors, as well as sellers. So over the next few years, how is that notion of the first line of defense going to change how, are we going to see customers start thinking about this and whether or not I'm a good customer? How, how do we anticipate, how do you anticipate kind of some of the social changes that are going to be made possible by the evolution of endpoint security and how it will make new demands on endpoint security? It, it's going to be, um, it's going to start with more visibility. I don't mean that in a very broad sense, but um, today we have antivirus solutions that were really targeted about just simple binary yes or no. Do I allow someone to execute or not? And that worked very well 10, 15 years ago. Um, increasingly over time, we know that it really hasn't because of been advanced attacks have come around. So now we're applying more visibility to that endpoint, saying what actually is occurring and how are those processes working together? If I see something operate from a, a, an email file, I click on it, something else happens, now all of a sudden there's code executing, that sequence of events or that stream becomes very, very important for a visibility standpoint. Our, our, natural, our, our product CB Defense takes that as a streaming prevention. We say, what is the risk factor scoring that we've applied to this and how does that sum together not only blocking good and bad, but now I'm getting into actions. So now that I'm paying more attention, that rolls into what are users doing? What are they actually doing on the endpoints and how does that policy dictate? I think for so long we said we can't approach endpoints because we can't control them and that's the CEO's you know, device or whatever it is. We're really changing that methodology. I think mindset wise people are okay with, I need more controls on the endpoint, I need more capabilities. That's going to start transitioning to having conversations about, well how do you control your endpoints? and suddenly there's more of a focus, besides just saying, do you have something installed to block stuff? That, that conversation got really short because it just doesn't work today. So I'm not saying do I have carbon black installed or anything else installed, it's what am I doing? What policy am I applying there? And then how does that match up to my um, business partners? Now I've made commitments to this customer. This customer's made commitments to me. Are those commitments being fulfilled and are, is someone trying to step beyond those commitments to do something bad? I, I, I never want to be the source of an attack to my partner. Right. <laughs> that would be the worst. Right, and, and well, there are some very high profile cases where an HVAC company, for example, suddenly discovered that they were a security risk mm -hmm. to some very, very big companies. What's supposed to happen that way? And, and to your point before, it was an HVAC company. Uh, I mean, nobody thought about HVAC being a targeted A industry. critical infrastructure. Right. Exactly, exactly, right. but it, it doesn't matter. People are after the data, they're after what's on the endpoint, and that's why we need to protect the endpoints as a first step. 
but obviously combining that with a bigger motion because it's not all endpoint. There has to be a, a network barrier. You have to have other things involved. There's cloud now and we're transitioning such a quick way and that's where partnerships are going to be formed. I really believe that you're going to see more and more partnerships over time with this collective nature of leveraging, um, Fortnite for calls it the intent-based uh, networking. Right, so in, in yes. intent base, what is the intent behind it? What is the, tar the attacker really trying to do? And, and I love that, that concept because it really does match up well with us. Well, but as, the, as, security, as security practices and technologies improve in one area, security practices and technologies have to improve in all areas. That's Otherwise, one part of that security infrastructure becomes the point that everybody's using There's for the, the attack. Right. Yeah, very true. Right. Right. So it's, it's all got to, I, my point is, a lot of people are now starting to think, oh, endpoint security, that's not that, this. No, it's, that too has to evolve, and it's going to in context. accrete value, and it has to, in, in context, it has to evolve in the context of the broader class of attacks and the things that people are trying to do with Absolutely. their data in digital business. Absolutely, and right. I think that you know, for a lot of customers to realize that they're making that a part of their overall security planning, you know, for three years out, what am I going to do and where do I stand at today? And, and obviously there's existing um, you know, license cycles and things like that on the network side as well. But I think a lot of customers are starting to formulate a whole plan about how do I look at my entire infrastructure? Forget what I have. Let me say I want to have certain protections in place. First off, do I have them? And if I not, can I plug something in that actually still will seamlessly integrate? And that's a really important point to a lot of the, our customer base. And speaking on kind of giving you the last word, Jim, you both talked about evolution here. As we look at where Carbon Block is today, uh, you were just named by Forrester as the, uh, the market leader for endpoint security, fantastic. Thank you. Looking at that, going into 2017, as we're in January 2017, the announcements from Fortinet today, what most excites you about this continued technology partnership? Continue with Fortinet? With or? Fortinet, yes. Okay, I thought it was clear, but overall it's good. Um, honestly, it's, 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 um, it's something as simple as their approach to the APIs. I mean, it, it's, it sounds silly, but at the end of the day, if their approach is really to leverage and to work with other partners, and that's what ours has been for a long time. So they're not saying it just has to be our product, it just has to be our solutions. They're saying whatever the customer's already invested in, we're going to make it better. And, and that's been a strong message we've had for a long time as well. I don't care what you've put in for a firewall necessarily, but I do want to be able to integrate with that because the customer needs that. It, it, it's not me being very um, selfish, so to speak. Customers are demanding that they have a, a simpler solution to manage. And it's that simplistic way of, that's where we're headed from an endpoint perspective, um, of having a solution that actually takes in everything from the environment and really makes it a, a, a common view uh, for the incident responder and the SOC personnel. And it's all essential for digital business transformation, which as we've been talking about, Peter, is the crux of that is, is data and the value and the trust in that. Well, Jim Brain from Carbon Black, thank you so much for joining thank us you. on theCUBE today. And on behalf of Peter Burris and myself, Lisa Martin, we thank you so much for watching theCUBE and we're going to be right back.